afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Let Learners Lead, Lessons from Microsoft's Social Learning Frontier. I'd like to start by thanking today's sponsor, Sublime Media. Sublime Media is the creative agency for learning, dedicated to crafting the best custom training anywhere. I'm Jess Thompson, the content manager for learning and development at ATD, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenters, David Linder and Jason Gray. David Linder is the co-founder and creative director at Sublime Media. David leads Sublime Media's creative and product development and specializes in learning approach design. Jason Gray is a senior learning development consultant at Microsoft. Jason empowers thousands of new hires that join Microsoft directly out of the university to dream big, be brave, share their gifts, and build their own extraordinary lives. And now, without further ado, David and Jason. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. All right, well, you should be looking at two of our smiling faces. Uh, here I saw video and on screen. Um, not going to spend too long reintroducing ourselves since Jess, thank you for introducing us. But um, I am David. I am the creative director at Sublime Media. And uh, for just about 23 years, we have been creating uh, custom learning and training experiences for medium and large size companies. Um, and today, I want to talk, we're here to talk about a program called Aspire Pi. Some of my favorite projects that we do are the ones that teach me as much as I feel like we're out there teaching other people. Um, and uh, we learn so much doing this. It is a what I consider to be a, a groundbreaking and innovative um, social learning program. So I want to start by inviting Jason, who has been um, our client for I think, Jason, it's been like a decade now. I'm, I feel a little old, but um, uh, it's, it's been a long time. We've built lots of great stuff together, but I want to invite you to, to tell everyone, give us some background on what is Aspire and what is Aspire Pi. Yeah, thank you. And it's a pleasure. I'm excited to be here with you all. It's like learning geeks unite, and I love that. Uh, let me give you some context to what Aspire is, because I think the context is helpful as we talk about this social learning program that we innovated on. So Aspire um, is a program, just did a great job of introducing me. And Aspire is a program that caters to the thousands, thousands of university hires and apprentice hires. We call them our early in career talent that join Microsoft. They, they come from every corner of the world, bringing their aspirations, bringing their talent, their potential, but let's also call it out. They're bringing with them a lot of anxiety and stress, but they're also hopeful and, and, and excited about this journey ahead. It's in this moment of transformation that our Microsoft Aspire experience looks to empower them to achieve, to thrive right here at Microsoft. And our mission or our challenge is to get them to amplify their skills, to basically uh, look at new opportunities, but also embrace being current and future leaders here at this company. This, this group of aspires, we do see them as those future leaders and we want them to make their mark right here at Microsoft, but probably even more importantly, in the world. And just said it, you know, to summarize what we try to do with the Aspire experience is to challenge them to dream big, be brave, and build their extraordinary lives. But how do we do that? So Aspire is built around three pillars. Those three pillars, you're seeing them here on the slide, and I'll go through them very quickly. The first one is on build network, which is how do you engage? Remember, these university hires are coming from wherever home is to a, a Microsoft location. And they're wanting to find people that have the same passions, interests as them. 
those passions or interests can be about artificial intelligence, which is all the buzz right now here at Microsoft, but also it could include people wanting or finding people that want to go on a hike on a weekend or playing music or video games, whatever it might be. The second pillar is around Accelerate Growth. We are a learning and development program at the center of it, and Accelerate Growth is that notion of how do we care for their personal and professional growth. We have three signature skills that we focus on within Aspire. I'm not going to go into the details on those, but we really want them to amplify the amazing skills that they're bringing in. Um, and all of these signature skills are around those traditionally are called soft skills, but I hate that term because I actually think they are power skills. The final pillar is around discover opportunity. This is our career pillar. This is where we want them to find their next move, hopefully here at Microsoft, but it's also about creating fans in the system and it's okay we get that they're going to leave Microsoft and pursue their passions, their purpose, possibly somewhere else. So, David, those are our three pillars. But one of the things that I wanted to, we talked about this Aspire experience. One of the things that you may not all realize is that it is a two-year learning and development program. Two years. And we had some challenges. So you've had some context on what Aspire is. What were some of the challenges that we were running into? And maybe somewhat similar challenges that you all are running into as well. The first challenge was we have a variety of initiatives and programs within our two-year learning and uh, development program, but we had gaps. We had huge gaps. That was challenge number one. Challenge number two was, okay, with those gaps, how can we also continue some of the learning after some of the other initiatives and programs? And how do we create that program that will embody these three initiatives or three pillars that we just talked about? Build network, accelerate growth, and discover opportunity. I, I We did put out a survey ahead of this session, and somebody uh, had shared that their definition of social learning, and we're going to get to, into some of this, I loved it because I was totally in this place two years ago. They said, is it an opportunity? Is it a myth or a fad? And I was totally there with you. And so what I do want to do is introduce you to our solution, Aspire Pi. To make a pie, you'll need six to 10 perfect strangers. Fold in unique ideas, talents, and perspective. Add in one hearty topic and a metric ton of energy. Set to blend, let it run about an hour, and voila. What do you get? Aspire Pie. Aspire Pie is the place to connect, learn, and grow for aspirers, by aspirers. This isn't a classroom, there are no lectures. Aspire Pi brings aspirers together to share and learn from each other's stories, successes, and challenges. Each week you will explore topics important to your career, your role, your life, and your experience at Microsoft. No two pies will ever be the same, because this is about you. Sign up soon, before the pie gets cold. I've been watching that video for like two years now since we started Aspire Pi and it never, never gets old for me. Uh, let me summarize a few things that you saw in that video. You know, I just said it's been two years since we started Aspire Pi. And right now we've had 2,400 what we call Aspires, uh, 2,400 Aspires that have voluntarily taken Aspire Pi. And I haven't been to a single session. You heard me right. We have no facilitators, no trainers, no subject matter experts. It is 100% Aspire driven for Aspires by Aspires. What happens is that each of the Aspires 
sign up for Aspire Pi, and we run it on quarterly ways. And they sign up for one of three offerings right now, and we're building out with Sublime a fourth one. The three that we have doesn't, you're probably not going to remember these titles, and they're not, they're kind of irrelevant, uh, but they're really not irrelevant. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Life Hack Pi, Balancing Pi, and Next Play Pi. And we're building a new one called My Best Pi. With some magic, after they sign up for Aspire Pi, we get them into those groups, those unique groups of six to 10 perfect strangers. And what they do is they take turns running these sessions one hour a week, every week for six weeks. One hour a week, every week for six weeks. That's what we do. So we have well over 2,000 people organizing themselves and sharing their, what it just called their successes, their challenges, their experiences, their stories. David, I'm, I, I've am i been talking a lot here. Anything I'm missing there? Um, I, I Nothing you missed, but so, just some things that uh, every time you describe it still kind of amaze me is somehow we convinced 2,000 people, thousands of people to kind of take ownership and do their own thing and we didn't have to schedule it for them. It just happens. Um, and it's kind of an amazing thing. Um, it's an amazing thing to be part of. It's, it's an amazing thing um, to, to watch. And I see, I see we already have some good questions. You're asking all these, all the good questions and we're gonna get to some of them. Um, they, they, that, uh, um, they're, that we had to go through and, and, and think about. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope we'll answer those. And if we don't, um, we will definitely answer them um, at the end. So, you know, we started this with, this is a social learning program. And that's how you started it with us. Um, you came to us and said, I want a social learning program. Um, you didn't say I wanted a Spire Pi that works in this way, that's one hour, six, that we all we'll figure that out later. But how did you know you wanted social learning? Yeah, it, it's a great question, David. And where it starts was with our culture here at Microsoft. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of press about Microsoft and its culture. Um, and it started here with our newest CEO. Microsoft has had three of them. Um, our newest CEO, Sachin Nadala, brought a culture in. And I'm, I'm going to be turning 16 years of age at Microsoft this year. And that shift in culture is tangible. You can, I would love to say you can taste it and smell it, but you can, you can feel it. You can absolutely feel it. And our culture was driven by this notion of growth mindset. And that's where Aspire Pi ultimately grew from was this notion around culture and growth mindset. We saw all of our Aspires as that incredibly gifted talent, but one of the things that I've seen is like Microsoft can go after some of the best soft, I'm using uh, one role as an example, some of the best software engineers coming from university, but they weren't looking for those types of people now. We're looking for great human beings and we have them coming into our company. They are those current and future leaders. And with that incredible talent, we knew that they needed to have conversations when they needed it, and it needed to be on somewhat their terms. But I also want to call out like when they need it and on their own terms can be somewhat dangerous as well. And so we knew those conversations were going to happen. So let's not shy away from them. Instead, let's see if we can guide those conversations. So we, we came to Sublime. Uh, and I actually came to Sublime with three things. By the way, I think, David, it's been nearly a baker's dozen, like 13 plus years I've been working with, uh, with your company. And I, I know this is not a sales pitch for Sublime Media. We're here to share best practices with you all. But one of the reasons I came to Sublime was for their wonderfully weird brains. Now, I mean that with 100% positive intent. I love weird brains because weird brains think differently. And we wanted to create 
an experience that was somewhat different here. We wanted to be able to innovate and Sublime is a great innovative uh, learning agency. And here are the three things that I came to them with. One, I wanted it to be, you've heard me talk a little bit about it, for aspires by aspires. By the way, we have a we have an Aspire Pi core team. I'll talk briefly about that later, but they are aspires that are helping guide work with Sublime on creating this content. The other big one, and kind of part of the reason why we're all here based on the topic is that it needed to be 100% self-directed, self-managed. There was no facilitator, no leader, no trainer, no subject matter expert. They are the experts. And then this one, it's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. I get it. We came with no learning objectives. You heard me right. No learning objectives. Yeah. David. That, um, that last one was a lot of fun. Um, because the, uh, the instructional designer in me, it's like you, you tied half my brain behind my back and said, okay, now, now go do this. Um, and it, it just became very clear very quickly that we had to approach this very differently. Um, and this is where I think we learned so much by going back to the beginning, um, by, um, by channeling our, our beginner's mind. Um, and asking ourselves some very, very, very basic questions. Uh, it started with, uh, what is social learning? Because it's, it's a very buzzy buzzword. I can go to conferences and I see lots of platforms that claim that they are social learning and um, lots of likes and bulletin boards and things like that. Um, so we had to ask ourselves, like, what, what is it? What are we really trying to get at? We also asked all of you this question. Um, I, because I wanted to, you know, wisdom of people here. Um, we we wanted to see what you thought, and uh, just just this is it right here. There were some immediate um, trends uh, that 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 happened that we saw here. Um, that it was about sharing, and it was about people. Um, there were also some really interesting specific ones, Jason. I know there are a few caught your eye there. Yeah, I, we did look at them all. Yeah, I did, very talked. Yeah, I already talked about that opportunity myth fad. Love that one because I was it, totally there. Uh, and there, there was a couple others. I'll just quickly call it. One person said learning, uh, learning things that matter from your community. There's a lot of beautiful things there. Number one, I, I want to kind of highlight the word matter, things that matter. This was actually something that our team was kind of as it was a design principle when we went into this. We wanted Aspire Pi to be revolved around moments that matter. That's where that Aspire Pi core team came into play. Really uh, helpful. Day I know it, you're all going to be shocked by this, but David and I are just a few months away from being uh, uh, from university life. And uh, yeah, it's been a several decades, I'll just call it that way. But we wanted to know what are those moments that matter. So I love that notion that somebody brought into this, uh, that definition of social learning, especially that things that matter. The other one that I want to quickly call out that I liked was structure to help people teach each other together. There's so much beauty in, in that one. Uh, the word structure is an interesting one. Because this is this, and we're, David's going to talk a little bit about this, about structure and how we looked at structure versus non-structure as well. So it's a beautiful one. But then this whole notion of getting people to teach each other together is the embodiment of what we were trying to do with that for us, by us. I could keep going um, and geek out, but I know we got a timeline on this. David, I'll, I'll let you turn it. I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, well, I mean, it uh, it occurs to me, like I said, that there this, this is all about people, and um, and we have a lot of people here. So we want to ask you. I'm really happy. I'm following the chat here as we're going, and and um, I'm really happy that some of you are are chatting with us here. Um, and I'm, we're going to ask you to 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 do it again here. 
Yeah. So I'm going to kind of lead this. I, I love what's going on in the chat, by the way. I'm trying to manage keeping my eye on the camera, keeping I know, my I'm eye on the chat. I'm taking some notes for later here. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Uh, the, for, for, we're going to do a quick activity with you all because we want to learn from you all as well. And so we're going to have you do this in the chat. And your mission in the chat I'll, I'll tell you what we're going to do and I'll model it. And then I'm going to have you put it in the chat. I want you to introduce yourself with your name, what company you work for and where you're located as well as what I call to ask me about. What's an ask me about and ask me about is your passion and interests. And by the way, they can be work related, learning related, or things that you love to do on the weekend. So I'll model this. My name is Jason Gray. I work at Microsoft. I'm based in Redmond, Washington. And you can ask me about bringing fun and play into learning, as well as wake surfing. That's what I would type into the chat. So right now, I want to see this chat light up with the 123 attendees that we have in this meeting. Uh, and and we'll, we'll kind of go through yeah. this. But David, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, um, yeah. Please tell tell us who you are, and I want to see your ask me about. If if I had to answer this question, um, I'm David. I work at Sublime Media here in uh, what today is a snowy Seattle. That was a little bit of a surprise. Um, and you can ask me about um, uh, good design and learning, um, and escape rooms, and baking, but mostly escape rooms. All right. Okay. I love it. Keep, keep them coming here. They're coming almost too fast for me to read. I, I already know, David, I'm going to be reaching out to some of these people. I hope I, I just hope I can get to this chat afterwards because there is talks about talent management in there. I need to know a little bit more about talent management. So I, I, I love that. Uh, yep. Salsa, I think, I don't know if I, I saw it so quick. I don't know if that was salsa dancing. Oh, it was salsa dancing, but I obviously Lee was getting a little hungry there when I was thinking about <laughs> salsa as well. Uh, so, so keep on cooking and learning. That, 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 that made me happy. It feels like, feels like a weekend. It's beautiful. 508 compliance. That, that takes some study. That's a good one. Okay, we got people from all over the place too. This is great. Thank you. Keep them coming. What I um, what we did this for is because I, I think it kind of gets at the heart of a lot of um, where where we started from and where we ended up, um, which is that people are the magic. Um, I just we could spend the rest of the day just with the hundred and some odd, you know, 123 people. And we still wouldn't get through all the stuff you all have mentioned. Um, the amount of wisdom that is in this random group of 120 people, Microsoft has, what is it, 160,000 employees? Just imagine where you work your company, your organization, wherever it is, just imagine the amount of wisdom that's kind of sitting there to be tapped. And, and I, I wanna bring it around to the, the, how we define social learning. Um, we, we came to, we borrowed a little bit from David Dunning, insight through people. That was the simplest definition of social learning that we could come to. The, the simplest definition of really good social learning, the kind of stuff that, that gets you to what matters. I do, I do really like that word. And I, I, moments that matter is, is a phrase I've heard a lot at Microsoft and some and other places of finding hey, that moments that matter to people. Yeah, and David, if you don't mind me interrupting, no, no, no. Um, you know, I think in that free survey, we asked people, are you doing social learning in your company? And yeah. I think yep, yep. the overall number, if I remember right, was like around an average of four out of 10. It was below, it, the average was below four and, and 50 and, and uh, half the people reported four or below. Yep. And I think the thing to call out is uh, if we were there, like Microsoft is on this journey right now. But we all 
you all need to recognize you were doing social learning uh, in the past as well. And, and David's going to talk a little bit about that. But just recognize, give yourself some grace. I'm sure all of you and your companies were already doing social learning. We were doing events in the past. Our events had a social learning component to it. So anyways, David, I, I digress. Yeah. I just wanted to no, go that's... back to that four out of four out of 10. That's a, that is fantastic segue into kind of where we're going because social learning, it shows up in so many different ways. And so we we mapped it. This is this is us part of our, you know, what is it? How does it show up? Social learning shows up in very orchestrated and arranged ways, and it shows up in very organic ways. When you think about these these two uh, um, two ways, you know, this this continuum here. Your orchestrated ways are things that as learning and development people, we are actually very familiar with. They tend to be structured, they tend to be instructor led, they tend to be prescriptive. In a classroom, they are events, they have agendas that you usually can't get away from. And on the whole other side is organic social learning. And this is the self-directed stuff. There's often just people, just regular people talking. Um, this is your, your, your so-called, um, what are cooler conversations? So even if you think you're not doing social learning, well, we don't do events and we don't do instructor-led things. We don't do, you're doing social learning because anytime you get two people or more together, they're talking to each other and they are exchanging information. Now, sometimes the information they're exchanging isn't accurate, right? And this is, Jason, you mentioned this earlier, like there's, there's always risk. There's always risk when, when you do this. Um, but that organic social learning is, um, is happening uh, everywhere. Um, and, I, and I think, again, as learning and development people, we are very familiar with the orchestrated social learning. So we started, again, we, we mapped this and we realized that what we were looking at is what we call the expertise continuum. That this is a guide we could use. What it is, is a continuum that tells us how much expertise and what type of expertise you need and can have at any point on this continuum. So the kinds of expertise you might use in orchestrated social learning is very different than the kinds of expertise that you would rely on for organic. So let's just kind of take a look at a few examples here. I'm gonna start in orchestrated. Again, the stuff that from, from an L&D standpoint, a lot of us are, are accustomed to. Instructor-led stuff, we get people together, we, we might put them in little groups. They ask some questions. Maybe I hear someone else asking a question. On that side, that orchestrated side, what kind of expertise am I relying on? I'm relying on, well, an expert, right? There's a facilitator. They are the expert. They are bringing all the information. It almost doesn't matter who's in my audience. It's a bunch of new people. It's a bunch of experience. I, don't, I got stuff to tell them. I'm going to tell them. Um, and, and so all that expertise comes from outside. Um, and you need a lot of it. If you take the lecturer out of the lecture, you are left with almost nothing, all right? So let's move, let's, let's nudge one to the left here. Think about college course labs, it's hands-on, maybe you got a teaching assistant. It's a different kind of expert, but I'm a little more hands-on, but I still have an agenda. I'm still, it's, the expertise is still external. I am still put on a track and I can't really deviate off that track. Let's take another bump to the left study group. Let's get a bunch of people together to talk about that class we were just in. We don't need an expert necessarily anymore, but we do have expertise. We have a curriculum, a, an agenda, um, a study guide or something that is guiding us. Now let's move over one more. Book club. Book club is social learning. We all read the same book, but usually in a book club, there's, um, it's just a discussion. Right? The book is the expertise, but there it really can go in lots of different places. And you're seeing the conversation start to move. Let's let's nudge on over a little bit more. Job shadowing. It's another form of social learning. I take you, we walk around the, the storefront and I tell you, this is how I sell, watch me here. Oftentimes, again, not with an agenda, we just kind of know it. And and whatever interactions might happen in the store that day or the things that that's, that's where we're going to go. We're not even on a track. And kind of way over in organic social learning, support groups are a great example of, of that. 
get a bunch of people together and talk about stuff. Could be things you've all gone through, could be challenges you're having, could be anything. Think about the last couple of examples I gave. Think about support groups and shadowing at book club, the, or the organic side of this, the difference in expertise you need. One, I don't really need external expert, expertise. I don't need an expert in the room. I don't need a facilitator. Sometimes I need a, a book or something like that, but oftentimes I don't. But the kind of expertise you rely on on this side, generational expertise. I've been there before. Let me help you. The wisdom of crowds, the organizational knowledge. Um, so what we did here is we, we kind of invented a way to talk about social learning and where we wanted to be. We invented ourselves a language. And this was very early on in the Aspire Prior Project, we did this. And I, I remember turning to you, Jason, and being like, okay, we have invented a language. Here's some basic vocabulary. You told us social learning. It's not that easy. So <laughs> you tell me, where do you want to be? Yeah, I, it, I remember this so vividly sitting down in uh, in meetings and having conversation with us banging our head about what is the right content to lead in this, trying to filter down on those topics for our program. By the way, it wasn't just David and I and or David Sublime and team and, and my team. It was those aspires as well. It took it, it took this continuum for us to have that common understanding, that common language. We were, let's be clear, like all of us, Aspires, myself, David, Sublime, we were all coming at it from different perspective. And we did have a variety of experiences that we did have those experiences at different levels on this expertise continuum. But let's be real, like I had, you might think, hey, Jason, you sit at Microsoft, you got tons of budget. No, we don't. We have very limited budgets. We have a limited amount of time, but we couldn't ignore the fact that our aspires needed to share their challenges and their achievements. So the, the sweet spot for us was on the left-hand side of that expertise continuum. Yeah, and I, I want to be clear that we're not making a judgment. There's nothing wrong with instructor-led courses. I mean, um, um, they we do them, we we create them. Jason, your program uses them, um, but there is something kind of magic. The more left you go, um, the more organic your social learning, the greater its potential for insight. And um, we could, there's lots of brain science to talk about that, but essentially, it's how we're built. It's how we're built as as people, um, and so that helped us, right? So when you, Jason, told us we want to be here, it, the, 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 the form of this and the structure that we needed to create and empower um, became more clear. And again, I'm following these questions in the chat and all the questions we asked ourselves um, about gripe sessions and how do you do this virtually? Because by the way, we did this during the lockdown. Like we, we, this Microsoft was fully remote at the time. Um, Aspire Pi happens uh, so it has happened fully remote virtually um, and is moving back to hybrid because now everything kind of needs to, to care for hybrid. Um, um, so we, 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 all of those things um, became clearer as we invented this language because we also realized that there is a parallel continuum on here. And it goes back to what Jason said about learning objectives, and he didn't have any. I actually think he said, I don't even care about learning objectives, which is almost blasphemy. Um, <laughs> so just like the amount of expertise varies on this continuum, how you design the learning experience and the learning and what you're making changes. Because when you're doing orchestrated, orchestrated social learning, we can do it the way that as learning and development professionals, we are um, accustomed to. We create our learning objectives. This is what we want people to get out of it. We test them on it. We do all that great stuff. As you move towards organic, as you move to the left on, in this continuum, learning objectives are less and less, and they, they, they're less and less useful. Um, and what we had to learn is we had to let go of outcomes, which was really 
hard. It was really difficult to say, let's get rid of the traditional outcomes and talk about different kinds of outcomes. And we, to do it, we gave them a name. We, we call them user experience objectives. We cared a lot more for how people were doing things than the, the what they were doing. Um, and and I'm gonna, we're gonna get back to this, this in a second because I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to participate in something that we did in order to use this continuum. But I wanna hit on that kind of last point just you know, for, for, for a minute. This was a big, a big lesson. You cannot force social learning to happen. You can put people together and you can tell them to talk to each other, um, but you can't force good social learning to happen. Um, you can't overstructure it, but you can create an environment in which it thrives. This, this one was, how do we create our environment? This is what we did for Aspire Pi. It was all about how do you create these really great environments? Um, so I wanna come back to our scale and um, I wanna try something with you all, live, we'll see how this goes, um, that we did because early on, again, Jason, he didn't come to me with topics. He didn't say, I want to teach this stuff. Um, and so we had to discover them. And we, we, we had a whole discovery process, but um, as part of our, uh, I think it's the life hack track, we had something called um, productivity. That's one of the sessions. They spend an hour talking about productivity. Jason, do you want to give a little background on that? Yeah. So we, you know, these are all busy people. You're all busy people. And we're like, hey, it'd be nice in this life hack. Life hack pie is all about what are some tips and tricks to be better here at Microsoft, not get so overwhelmed with everything that might be uh, happening to them. And one of the topics that came up was on productivity tips. So think about it in such a way that like maybe people sharing how they uh, deal with their email inbox, some tips and tricks on using uh, meetings and invites better. Teams, we use Microsoft Teams, not Zoom. Uh, but, and then, you know, what are some other uh, productivity tips and yeah. tricks to balance that work-life schedule that they have to uh, deal with daily. So we have a poll that's gonna go out here. Um, there it is, you should see the poll, I've seen it on, on my screen here. I want you to tell us what you think. Where, if I said productivity, we're gonna do social learning or productivity, more organic, more orchestrated, right? Do you need, on the ones and twos and threes. I don't need a lot of outside expertise. Um, or do I need expertise? Do I need someone coming in and saying, here's how to be productive. Here's how to do this. So go ahead and, and um, pick your answer there. Um, and again, towards organic, the lower numbers, maybe no expertise needed. Maybe not even any guides. Um, maybe just other people. Towards the orchestrated, um, no. I need, I need a facilitator for this. I gotta make sure that um, it's, it's, they're, they're getting exactly what I want them to get. So when you hear productivity and the way Jason talked about it, um, what are you thinking? So we'll just give that, um, yep. A and as I'm noticing in the chat, um, this question is not as black and white as I am making it out, but I am making you make one choice. That is a radio button. Um, yeah, and I love the chat that's going on. Yeah, hey, I love it. It, yep, it totally depends. We kind of were trying to provide a little bit of a uh, of an easier pitch on this one, but it is not easy. And and let me just kind of reframe this. I just talked about hey, if productivity was about some of the communication tools and not to get overwhelmed uh, with one's work life schedule. But what if I was to shift that conversation? And by the way, I'm seeing the results yeah, here. We'll come back also. to it. But you know, you know, to try I, to ran to uh, boy. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, Leah. There was like it depends. Well, what if I was to change the situation? I said Microsoft has got, or your company has got, some new project management software coming to. Uh, all of its employees, and we need to make sure that they're all highly productive. Would you rate it the same way, David? Right. And so I'm going to, like, if I look at the, 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 
the answers here, and I'm seeing it. These are these are definitely our people, Jason. I'm loving this chat. Um, for our productivity, we were one to two, because if I just took if I took ten random people in this chat and said I'm going to give you ten minutes, I'm going to give ten people ten minutes. I want you to come up a list of your best productivity tips, and then I put you all in a room together and said share. We would all come out of that room being more productive. Could I guarantee that any single productivity tip was included? No, I could not. Could I guarantee that we all thought about productivity in a different way? Yes, I could. So I, I love this stuff. But the people who answered five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you're not wrong. You're not wrong at all. Because if I had a purpose in that, so if I was going to do a new um, a new productivity tool, um, if if um, if I was going to teach you the Pomodoro productivity method, right? You. You, uh, you, you set a timer for 25 minutes, you do a single task, you take a five minute break, you do four Pomodoros and you take a 15 minute break. Lots of people love that system. That's probably not gonna come up. It might come up if I had asked you to do that, you know, your, your 10 things. But if I wanted everybody at Microsoft, that's it, we're adopting the Pomodoro. Then I need to be a seven, eight, nine or 10. The, the, the structure I give, the experts in the room, everything changes based on kind of where we are. And conversely, if I want to be organic, I can't do that. And that was a big lesson for us, that we wanted to be a one, two, maybe a three. And so we had to resist inserting expertise all the time because we did it. We would create a structure and open. Well, what if we gave them a list of resources? And what if we did this? And what if we, and every, we constantly were telling ourselves, stop, stop doing that because it's going to ruin it. You're not going to get organic social learning if you're starting to put in stuff that only belongs in orchestrated social learning. So I want to, I want to talk about then what we did, which are these user experience objectives. And I want to, I'm going to give you two examples. Um, and I, we definitely want to leave room for questions here. So um, and because there's lots of good ones. Um, but I want to talk about just a couple of, of our user experience objectives and what they looked like for us. We had a lot of them. Um, but we tried to keep them simple. We tried to keep them achievable. And one of our core ones was everyone participates, which we always want people to do. Um, and thank you all again for doing that right now. Um, we wanted everyone to, to participate in what we were doing, which um, isn't easy to get people to do. Even in groups of six to 10, there, it's easy to be quiet. Um, we also, there was sort of a parallel UXO here that, that was solved in the same way, which was the self-running. We haven't talked too much about that, but the idea that these things had to run themselves, we weren't gonna schedule them, we weren't gonna time them out. So we solved this by perhaps a strange inspiration. Um, I don't know how many of you know the game Dungeons and Dragons. Any, I don't have any RPG people in the in the house here. Um, it was you, funny, David, when we were doing this because yeah. we both looked at each yes. other and said, "This is Dungeons and Dragons." Dungeons and Dragons. And I don't play Dungeons and Dragons, but I do watch Stranger Things, and yes. so uh, that's how a lot of people know it. Um, for if you don't know Dungeons and Dragons or or all role playing games in general, tabletop role playing games. Um, uh, this is a this is a game where, oh, I don't know, four to six to ten people sit around, um, and and they uh, everyone takes on like I'm a fighter and you're a healer and you're a, a wizard and we go and we fight orcs and we find treasure, um, and we realize that if you just kind of remove the orcs and replace treasure with professional development, we we kind of had it like and so what we did is we created roles for um, for our pie. And um, like, I'm just gonna show you just a couple of them. You need someone, we, we did provide a PowerPoint deck that had kind of conversation starters. Jason's gonna talk about that in a second. Um, but we need someone to share their screen, right? Uh, we, that's the host. We needed someone to schedule the meeting. We called them the conductor. Um, we needed someone, we built in feedback into Aspire Pi. So we were getting feedback. Um, instead of the wizard, we had the quizzard. And the quizzer's job was to ask people certain feedback questions to come back to us. We had timekeepers. We had all the business of the meeting was a role that you took on. Um, and we gave them these little stretch goals. You'll see there the, the checklist of your core stuff and your, your extra stuff. And um, we also like 
who doesn't want these things to be fun, right? So we figured, let's make a role for fun. Uh, we called it the Meowza. And the Meowza was job was to like share memes in the chat. Um, this was all done over Teams. You can put animated GIFs. That's how most of my meetings go. I, we're, we're communi we have a whole back channel of animated GIFs based on what's happening in, in the main channel. Um, and also some fun little, little side quests for them too. Um, but asking people to take on these roles meant you're all essential to this functioning, even the Meowza. You're all, um, you, you, we, we need you all working to, to make this happen. Um, both the, um, the functional parts of making sure we're meeting and uh, like another role we had was if you notice someone, you're, you're the person who, if you notice someone being quiet, you need to ask people to stop and ask them a question, right? So we're caring for even things that facilitators um, uh, might do. Um, but it also made everybody participate. Um, I want to go over one other, and Jason, I'm going to let you um, talk about another um, of our user experience objectives. Yeah. So, by the way, I can never get enough. I'm totally with you. Uh, uh, I think it's Jeannie that said that Kitty is the best. I, I, once I heard about these different roles and we started to get into these different roles, it took a life of its own. And uh, it's even extended into our pie groups where they can create their own yeah. roles if they want to as well. Uh, uh, Jason, um, just before, one thing I did want to mention about that uh, towards everyone participates and, and everybody, one of the reasons we made them like that, we made people screen backgrounds. We want the cameras on. You know how hard it is to get people to turn cameras on in meetings nowadays? I mean, turn the cameras on. Um, but we made these really cool backgrounds for everybody. And so in order to have the background up, you had to turn your camera on. So that's how we got everybody's cameras on it. People started like, I noticed them in other meetings. People would like be like, I mean, like, what's what is a meowza? And then they would explain it. So sorry, sorry to jump in on there, but I know it, 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 it is them. laughable when you do see screenshots of them uh meeting virtually. Uh it did encourage them to turn on their cameras. One is that was by the way, another user experience objective, which was how do we get them to engage the way we want them to engage with this close intimate experience by turning on their cameras. And that was uh, creating those backgrounds was a vehicle for that. But here we are talking about UXO2, which is this notion of guide, but don't prescribe. This is really where you know some of the conversation in the chat is like, how do you get them going? Well, this is where this magic came in. So how do you got so we've talked about how do we guide the conversation that we want to have happen in their pie groups? So we created what we call sparks. Sparks. A spark uh, can come in lots of different forms, but a spark is basically something to ignite the conversation. So one powerful example of a spark is asking a question. Asking those moments that matter type of questions and getting them to respond. Another example is through some activities. Uh, they provide sparks as well. Let me give you an example. Uh, I've talked about three offerings. This offering is in our next play pie, which is very much a career focused pie. And one of those topics, uh, again, Aspire-driven topics is how do you advocate for yourself? How do you advocate for yourself? There's a lot of content out there about how to advocate for yourself and all, all fantastic content, but we wanted to put this to the test. So we created an activity and the activity step one was think, reflect on your time since joining Microsoft, and what are you most proud of since you joined Microsoft? What are you most proud of? It could be for some leading a team meeting or a customer conversation or, or finding a bug in some code. Uh, they needed to come up with one, one single thing that they were proud of since they joined Microsoft. Then we got them to talk about that achievement, but not just talk about it, boast the crap about that experience, like go over the top, boast about it in a way that your grandmother might even be embarrassed. And so what we found out, what do you think they found out? You're probably thinking it to yourself, is that they were not actually over-exaggerating, that what they were boasting about was impactful. 
And we heard that in the feedback. So that's a very quick example of a spark. We have multiple of them. Uh, that was it. Oh, uh, yeah, that was yeah. it. And so I, I want to try, we're coming to a close here and, and we've got 10 minutes um, and I want to try and answer, I'm not going to be able to get to all these questions. Um, but um, I, so very quickly, Jason, uh, tell them how it went. Yeah, well, first of all, it's been freaking awesome. Uh, it's been freaking fantastic. I would love to use another word than freaking, but I'm not going to do that here on this call. There's a, a multitude of reasons. Number one, uh, you know, Sublime has been an incredible partner and I'm not, you know, you've seen some of the, what I call that wonderful, weird mind at work. Uh, I think I have that wonderful, weird mind as well. But also our qualitative and quantitative feedback have shown a difference that Aspire Pi is making. You're seeing some uh, some antidotes from some of our aspires in our recent Aspire Pi. But you know, you're seeing an overall theme here to this feedback around this notion of connection and learning from others. But I'll also call out one of my favorite quotes is this one. You taught me nothing, but I learned a ton. That is gold for me. I love that quote. Um, I, to me, this is when we know we've done something right for this Aspire. So I want to open this up for questions. Um, at this point, I, what I hope is that you're all excited. Maybe some of you are saying, one Aspire Pi, please. Um, and um, what I, what I want to say is, uh, uh, no, you can't have it. Um, because that was, that was for and by those aspirers. Um, the for and by, the, the making this, this resonate with people, it has to be for and by the people you're, you're going to be uh, teaching. This isn't something that just you, you can transfer from one org to another. The lessons, absolutely. Um, we've learned so much, and we are talking to other companies about creating social learning programs. I saw this question before about not just for new employees, but what about for new leaders or what about for leaders that have been there for years, that what we've learned can be applied to all that, but that it should, everything here reflects Microsoft, reflects Aspire, feels like that. It's going to feel different, even if it uses the same lesson. So I know we only have a few minutes left. Jess, how do you want to do questions? There's a ton of them. I could be here for hours. Yeah, absolutely, David and Jason. There's so many questions in the chat, so much great conversation. I'll start working backwards. We'll we'll do our best to get to yeah, everyone's we'll be, questions. We'll try and answer them quick. Yes, absolutely. So in reference to the roles that you spoke about for the Aspire program, did you did the participants self-select these roles? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll, I'll answer that one very quickly. We gave them the opportunity to sign up for what is called an essential role, which is the host or the conductor, as well as what we call bonus roles. And what we're finding is we're now in our third wave that those people that didn't want to take on those bonus roles at the beginning are now signing up for the essential roles. So anyways, that's the very quick answer to that. Awesome. All right. Um, next question is, are the organic sessions that you spoke about earlier done virtually? I find that virtually it's a little harder to create freeform conversations. So I'm wondering how it plays out here. Uh, uh, yeah, for the past two years, uh, for the past year, I guess it's been going on for a little over a year now. Um, this has all been done over Teams virtually. But Jason, I know there are plans, you know, for it to be hybrid, but I don't know that. Um, the virtual nature of it has gotten in the way at all of the, 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 the feedback we've gotten has not been, it's hard to have these conversations. The feedback we've gotten has been, this is making it easy to have those conversations. Can I, I, I want to also just add on to that because we have in our process of having them sign up, we do ask them if they want to meet in person in locations where we have centers of, what do you want to call it? Centers of mass where there's more aspires like the the one person sitting in Fargo, North Dakota. I'm not trying to pick on Fargo. Obviously, there's not enough people there. But here in Redmond, we do offer in-person locations, and we find that those 
meet wanting to meet in person there's also the challenge in doing that because they either one have to come into the office or number two they got you know we have a big campus and they got to go across campus so even those in-person groups aren't necessarily meeting in person but they are taking the opportunities what we have found is they are connecting at you know moments uh like birthdays or just you know once a once every three months just to connect so we are finding that as well outside of of aspire pi awesome all right next question how would this work for smaller companies where no one is really a stranger um that's that, that that's a really good question i don't i don't think being a stranger is a requirement of this i think it can work really well off of existing relationships um, one of the things we had to do, the way Pi is structured, it's six weeks, there's an intro, there's four weeks of topics, and there's an outro. We set it up that way because we had trust building to do. We knew we were working with strangers, and we wanted conversations to go well, so I can't just, if I, if I throw you in the deep end of the pool, all you do is scrabble to get out. Uh, we, we had to get you in there gently, um, and so we had to build trust. Um, I think in smaller organizations, some of that is some of the familiarity is already there. You can get deeper faster, um, but I, I do think it, I do think you could um, you could make this happen. Sounds sounds great. Diving into the chat again um, at the bottom here, is there any sharing out of best practices within any given pie with other groups um, scalability? Not sure. Yeah, this is a good one. Uh, yeah. And we've started, this is where we will continue to evolve. Uh, we are now introducing heavy pie engaged teams that come back to us and say, oh my goodness, this is so awesome. We'd love to meet other groups. We're now starting to expand that. So we have made some of those connections to date. David didn't know that. Um, but, uh, and I think this will continue to evolve in this regard as well. So it's great. Yeah, we also, early on, we, we were having discussions about how you share pie to pie. Um, remember, we had the uh, what's your pie soundtrack, right? Where you oh, yeah. come up with your, your pie soundtrack, and then we would kind of make this master playlist for all the pies. So there, there, there has always been thought of how do we get a pie of pies together and, and start pushing this in. But at the same time, the personal relationships between pies are not there. So it's different, right? So something I said in my pie, which with people I've known for three, four, five, six weeks, it's gonna, is, is, is different. Um, it's gonna have different contexts and stuff. So again, even the structure and how you do that uh, has to be thought about. Awesome. And Jess, can I uh, very quickly, sure. uh, I saw one earlier uh, about, hey, have you tried different um, what it was different peer groups, different levels, for example, a senior leader with our early and career talent. Have we dabbled in that? Yep. Yes and no. We've dabbled it in, in things like reverse mentoring type of programs. However, we do. So there is another group at Microsoft that it's called the partner form. I'm not going to go. I'm not an expert. It's a sister group of ours. They have partners and above at Microsoft. So these are very uh, leadership focused individuals in leadership roles. And we have our aspires. There has been talk of like, do we bring those groups together somehow, some way and haven't figured it out, but it is, it's out there on the dream board. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. I'm glad that you addressed that question. That's where I was going to go next. Oh, awesome. look at there. All right. Is the next one on gripes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I the next one, one was yeah, the next one was um how do you prevent the downward spiral keeping meetings from becoming gripe sessions? Yeah, that was on there as well. I, I'll answer it the quick way. It was UXO2 that we just talked about. We talked about this notion of the downward spiral and how do you stop that? It's actually a combination of UXO2 and UXO1, which is we wanted to guide the conversations we threw out those sparks. And we also had roles that are helping manage that timekeepers, 
people calling out like, okay, we're getting off topic. And by the way, getting off topic is okay as well. So yes. I want to quickly call that out. But if we, if the team felt like this was a direction to go in, we, we let them go. like there is. We, we encourage them to break our rules anytime they want. To. Um, exactly. Like Jason, there were also things just about gripes. There were, there were topics when we started looking at the expertise continuum that we thought we were going to discuss that we decided not to. DE and I was a big one, right? We were like, oh, this would be great. And then we we thought about it for a long time and said, this is not going to fit in our ones and twos because of the downward spiral, because we were like, no, we, we need more expertise than we were able to put into a group in order to have that conversation. So we knew there were risks. We approached those risks. Um, I will say this though, we know there's external social media groups for these very same aspirers. They're out on Facebook and all the rest of them. They're having those conversations. They're ha all the conversations we don't want them to have, the gripes, they're having them and there's no stopping them. What we wanted to do was give them an alternative outlet of what if you could have really productive conversations that overcame the gripes that were happening out here. We thought that's what Aspire Pi could do by connecting with other people. We haven't even talked about it. I know we're at time, but the, the, the building of empathy between different roles and different regions and, and just how it makes an organization work is just kind of incredible. Awesome. And by the way, David already called it out. What you're trying to do with your company and with your audience, is it pieable? That's it's a term that we've used. Is it pieable? In, in all likelihood, no. But David does have a few kind of yeah, I, I, I think we've, we've answered, we're at time and I wanna respect everybody's time. So I just kind of wanted to, we have a deck that'll go out, that'll have our last few thoughts in it, but Jess, I'll hand it to you to kind of close up and say thank you. And to, to the one person of how do, how do you do this at your org? I, I will shamelessly say, call us, <laughs> we can help. <laughs> awesome. Thank you both for this fantastic presentation. We are at time. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for your great participation and your engagement. Thank you again to our sponsor, Sublime Media, for this afternoon's webinar. Take care, everyone. Take care, David and Jason. Have a great rest of the Thank week. you all. Thanks for participating. And this concludes today's webinar. We thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at webcast.td.org and we will send our registrants an email tomorrow with this link. Please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts at webcast.td.org events. Goodbye.